I'm going to take you back to a question that we asked, uh, you addressed earlier on about the trustee versus delegate and trustee. Um, there's that process of gathering information and listening and voting based on what the public sees from what you're hearing. And um, on the other hand, you having the information and doing what, based on what you understand from the information, doing what you think is in the best interest of. And so it sounds like you'd like to do a little bit of both of those things. Yeah, I think the, the, the question is who, who are my constituents? And I have a second part to that question. Just okay. um, how, what kinds of things do you actually do to either share the information with the public and also listen and kind of get a feel for what okay. what the public would like you to do as far as voting and taking action? Well, let me let me say first that you have to decide who is your constituent, and that's the voter. But it's also tomorrow's voter. And you have a fiduciary responsibility when you're on city council to think further ahead than your next election. I said from the beginning that my current term would never be about the next term. Uh, it would do what I had to do when I had to do it, and I would make the right decision every time, period. So you can have some folks who holler a little bit and say, well, you know, we want to spend on wastewater, which is a huge issue here right now. Uh, but you've got to think about the your, your children and your grandchildren, the people who are going to live in this valley 20 years from now. And so sometimes you have to temper that. Um, how, how do I go about listening? Well, it isn't uh, difficult because people will <laughs> track you down. Uh, I listen in HEB, I listen at Valentino's, I, I listen when I'm pumping gas. Uh, people call me, people email me. I always answer every email, period. I answer every email. Um, I believe uh, I believe that if you're a reasonable person and you have the same inf information that I have, you would probably make the same decisions that I make, probably. Because I'm not smarter than the average bear, just sometimes I have more background information than the average person does. So uh, people call me, I, I talk to them, it's, it's a constant feedback si situation. And I'll give you a good example is the uh, FBI firing range. Well, I actually missed the meeting where they introduced that issue, which is not an excuse or anything, but I missed that meeting. And I came back to find that that's what we had. We had agreed to explore that issue. I'm thinking that's probably not a great place to put a firing range. People aren't going to be over, over, overly happy, but they had, they had, or I'm not sure, maybe I even voted for it, but we had commissioned a, a study. You know, somebody's going to give you a, a million bucks or so. Uh, you don't want to turn it away offhandedly. You really want to study the issue. So we, we did a survey, a study, a consultant's analysis. I didn't want to make up my mind until after we had the study results. Simple as that. Now, I know people think, well, he's not listening. We're, we're standing here telling you we don't want it. I heard that. I don't want to hear the study. I just think it would be terribly wrong to spend a lot of money on a, on a survey and then ignore it. So sometimes it looks like I'm a little bit slow on the trigger. I'm actually getting all the facts. And I share all the facts that I can. You're the only incumbent in this race. Do you think that puts you at an advantage or a disadvantage? Well, you know, there is this... Uh, throw out all the rascals chain of thought. And that's attractive. It's attractive to me too, you know, get rid of them all. Um, but it's lazy. Uh, it's lazy thinking. You, you need some tribal knowledge. You need some experience. You need to say, well, yeah, we did this uh, two years ago and it didn't work and let's not do that again kind of thing. Uh, so you do need some tribal knowledge and it is important that you don't throw the baby out with the, with the bathwater. So while I'm sort of a, yeah, throw them all out, well, I, I, think there, I think we have to be intelligent about it and selective about it. So in that respect, I think um, it's not a particular advantage to be an incumbent. I think the advantage of being an incumbent is that I have a track record of making honest, candid, transparent, 
decisions. I don't think anybody's ever had to wonder what I was thinking. Um, I think that's an advantage. You, you know what you're getting when you, when you vote for Scott Gross. You don't know what you're getting with someone else. Looking back on your, uh, your track record here at the City Council, as you alluded to earlier, our population here is three times, I think, the state average for senior yep, citizens. right at three times. So that puts a lot of pressure on our elected officials to provide services and, and to address the needs of the senior citizens. But one thing you also alluded to earlier is that some of those needs require younger professionals to come and live in the community. So the only way you can do that is address family and younger professionals. What have you done in your time on the council to address the needs of families and middle income? Well, you know, a great, a huge need of young families is schools, and the council doesn't control schools. Um, we've got that, I think. We've got a good school system. Uh, if it were up to me, I mean, if it was then the, this king idea instead of the council member, uh, I would uh, do something to work on the dropout rate. but. We've got enough on our plate at the city rather than to, than, than to try to run the uh, school system. But as far as, well, I think the River Trail will be a huge amenity, number one. And we've got some new businesses coming into town. Uh, the thing at the Family Sports Center is going to be spectacular. Uh, that'll be a very, real attractive to young people. Um, we need affordable housing. And the city is working now to maybe make a, a land deal with... Uh, Schreiner College that would allow them to put together some acreage that would be appropriate for affordable housing. I think it's attainable is the, is the new word. Affordable is no longer in play here. But yeah, we're doing whatever we can to support that. We support the Habitat for Humanity, which is my favorite charity, and the uh, Home Opportunities Board. Um, we support them. Talking about the future of Kerrville, do you see a civic center in the future, and, and how? Uh, oh man, Mike! And what about the city? Uh, what role should they play? Could you just pretend you didn't ask me that question? <laughs> <laughs> um, I am a supporter of a convention center done right, not done wrong, done right. Now, what is done right? What is the definition of is? Is I guess how, as Mr. Clayton would say. Um, First of all, let me tell you, I think it's almost a moot point in some respects because the developers, the developers, the hoteliers, the big guys, the guys who are doing the Hyatt Hill Country Resorts, that kind of thing, because of the economy, they're out buying existing properties at 10 cents on the dollar. They're not paying 100% on the dollar to build a new one. So I'm not sure that that makes a lot of difference anyway. But here are the numbers. We have 600 hotel rooms that are suitable for a conference. When we're at peak season, we're booked 85%. That leaves 90 rooms. 90 rooms will not support a convention center. It won't do it. It won't work. Not enough rooms. And that's assuming that you'd be willing to book people all over the city instead of putting them in one spot. I attend, some years I've attended 80 and 90 conferences. and. Very rarely does anybody want a convention where the convention hotels here and the convention centers over there. They always want it together. So convention center done right, in my mind, means it comes with a new hotel. That's number one. Um, 